And uh, as I said, we'll share this recording at the end with everybody. So uh, Martin, have you, are you able to see all the results there? Looks like most yeah, of the automotive. Yeah, okay, good. All right, well, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Martin, and uh, we'll end the poll and I'll hide my face and we can get started. All right. Thanks a lot, Rick. Um, I hope you see my screen. Otherwise, let us know in the chat and, uh, and we'll look into it. So my name is Martin. And uh, as Rick presented, this webinar will be about Canvas data logging. Uh, and we're happy to, to be uh, introducing this together with uh, Greg Connect, our partner in the US. Just uh, for the agenda for today, let me just see if that has been moved. Just a second here. And I, I think that got deleted. Yeah, so here we go. So just a quick overview of today's agenda. I'll be giving a brief introduction and then I will go through the basics on recording Canvas data. After that, I will uh, go into the CanEdge, which is our hardware, our Canvas data logger series for recording Canvas data and Linvas data. And after that, I will introduce the various software tools that you can use together with these devices. We will aim to have some time for Q&A in the end. Uh, so feel free to post any questions you have in the chat for that. Briefly about us, uh, CSS Electronics, we uh, started in 2015 and we're based in Denmark. And our specialty is Canvas hardware. Specifically, we are quite good at creating Canvas data loggers and sensor to CAN modules. And that is what we focus on. We have been growing very fast since we started. In particular, we had doubled in 2021, which is 2020. And today we serve more than 3,000 companies across 100 plus countries. Our main segment are automotive and industrial OEM engineers. So that means we specialize in solutions that cater to this type of, uh, of end user. And it looks like, uh, based on the slightly small uh, subset of, of um, inputs, that this also reflects the group that is present in the webinar today. You can see some of the uh, companies using our devices below, and you can see more case studies on our website where we have more than 50 of these. Briefly about me, my name is Martin uh, Falk, and I'm one of the co-owners at CSS Electronics, and my responsibilities are within sales and marketing. Um, that means that all the content, all of the videos, all of the articles that you will see online, like our intros and other things are done by me. Um, so I, I know fairly much about the broad uh, strokes of Canvas and the related protocols. In addition to this, I send around 30,000 mails per year uh, to uh, engineers within this area in terms of technical support and sparing. Uh, so I get a lot of, you can say both face-to-face -face and mail time with the type of end users that use these types of pro products. To get us started, um, I will just give a really quick introduction to Canvas, just so we have a bit of context in place. I will assume most of you know it, but let's just do a quick version of this. Canvas is a technology that enables communication between CAN nodes or ECUs. So if you have a vehicle, you have multiple small controllers, they communicate data with each other. And the way they do this is through the Canvas network in very simplified terms. The Canvas networks, uh, a network consists of a, the CAN high and CAN low wiring harness that allows for communication between these ECUs and for, uh, for transferring packets of data between them. The packets of data are contained in what we call Canvas frames, which looks uh, as you see here for the uh, classical CAN frame a CAN frame consists of a number of fields uh, of which the CAN identifier here on the left in orange and the CAN data payload are of particular importance when it comes to Canvas data logging as we'll get to in a, in a moment. Today, uh, Canvas is pretty much the standard when it comes to everything within the automotive industry, but also far beyond uh, within industrial automation, within the maritime sector, drones, exoskeletons, aerospace, you name it. There are an extremely wide array of applications in which Canvas is the technology of choice. Within this area, we, uh, we typically distinguish between what we call higher layer protocols. So one thing is Canvas, which forms the basis of everything you see also here, uh, or can at least form the basis. But there are a number of subsets or higher layer protocols that are based on Canvas. 
One important example is the J1939 protocol. This is the standard when it comes to heavy duty vehicles like trucks, excavators, and many other types of, uh, of vehicles. When it comes to OBD2, that is the standard in most cars, or at least non-EV cars today. So most modern cars will use or facilitate OBD2 communication on top of their existing CAN bus communication. And the same goes for many uh, light vehicles and heavy duty vehicles. Then you have UDS, which has similarities to OBD2 being a request-based protocol and is also used within uh, cars and heavy duty vehicles, enabling both the communication and extraction of data values, but also the configuration uh, of ECUs and many other use cases. And then you have something like CanOpen, which is used predominantly within industrial automation. So just to give an idea of some of the different protocols that are used uh, and are based on uh, CAN bus. The common denominator is that you can record all of these as long as you can record Canvas data and as long as they are based on that. As you can imagine, uh, because Canvas data is so popular and because it is used in so many applications, there is also a, a lot of use cases for recording Canvas data and for working with that data. And that's what we're going to cover a bit today. How do you actually do that in real life and in practice? What are some of the considerations when, uh, when you get into this? The first step uh, is of course that you need a device for recording the data and we'll cover our devices a bit uh, later. But assuming you have a device like ours, how do you then connect it to your application? That can be simple, uh, but it can also in some cases be a bit more tricky. If we uh, consider, for example, here on the left, you have a, an excavator, a heavy duty vehicle, and in many cases, you might be able to use what is called a Deutsch 9-pin connector, or also referred to as a J1939 adapter cable. So in other words, if you were to go into the cabin of this excavator, look uh, you know, near the steering wheel, you might be able to find a connector that matches the adapter cable you see here on the right with the green adapter. If so, then most likely that connector is a standardized J1939 connector and you would be able to take an adapter cable like the one we have on our products page and directly connect to it. And then everything is simple. In real life, however, um, different heavy duty vehicles can have different connectors. That is why just right, to, uh, right next to this one, you have a Caterpillar adapter. Looks the same, it's not exactly the same. So these types of things you need to identify if you're going to record data from a vehicle and in particular, this is the case if you are in the aftermarket and you're not necessarily familiar with how to physically interface with a vehicle or an application that is of interest to you. Other examples here that you can see on the right include the OBD2 adapter, which is commonly, commonly used in cars. You have a generic adapter cable where you might need to create your own custom connector, then this can be useful. You have the N12 adapter useful in ships and maritime applications. And sometimes you just need to record data directly from the CAN bus wiring a harness. And here the CAN crocodile can be used to allow you to do a contactless recording of CAN bus data. So we, su we supply a lot of different cables, um, but as a first step, when you start recording CAN bus data, you need to make sure to identify what does the pinout look like that you need to connect to in the vehicle. And in particular, you need to identify where are the can low and the can high pins? And where are the power and ground pins? These four pins are what you need in order to connect a data logger like ours. Once you have uh, identified the way to connect to the vehicle, then you're good to go in most cases. But there are some exceptions that are good to know. More and more uh, today, you will find that there may be gateways that block the access to the canvas data when you use one of the uh, available connectors this is often the case in electric vehicles and modern cars, for example. Um, and that means that you will not be able to get access to the, you can say, stream of raw canvas data going on in the vehicle, all of the communication between the ECUs. But you can often request data through these gateways. If you're not able to request data either, then you would essentially need to get around the gateway, for example, using something like the CAN Crocodile to find another way to record the canvas data. Another thing to be aware of is that in particular, when it comes to heavy duty vehicles, you often have the relevant canvas data of interest split across multiple canvases. So 
you may have found access to one CAN bus network in the vehicle, which has one subset of the available data, but there can easily be two, three, four, and we have seen cases of eight uh, CAN bus uh, networks in a single mining vehicle, for example. So this varies a lot. Uh, often you have the most relevant data between one and two CAN buses, but this is again something that is important to know when you wish to connect to a CAN bus network. Once you have connected, uh, you are in a good place. Now you should most likely be able to record the raw CAN bus data. And that is what you see on the left-hand side in this particular slide. You will see that there are a selection of timestamps. There are some CAN IDs here, these identifiers that were the ones in orange in the uh, CAN frame. And then you have your payload or your data bytes over here. And if you are a super cool engineer, then you can just interpret this as if it was the matrix. But if that's not the case, you will need some way to decode this information to something that makes sense to normal people. The way you do this is illustrated in this small illustration over here. You essentially have your raw data, which is what we see over here. And then you need uh, something magical called a DBC file. And the DBC file is essentially a small database that tells you how to go from this to this over here, where on the right-hand side, you have again your timestamps, but now you have the signal values, also known as physical values, and also sometimes referred to as human readable form, scaled engineering values, they have many names. Essentially, it is parameters that you can plot and visualize like engine speed, temperatures, fuel level, all of the stuff, stuff you might be interested in, in order to actually make use of the data from, let's say a truck, or a car or a robot. As explained, the golden key here is the DBC file. A DBC file is essentially just a text file down here, uh, which has a specific format and which tells you how every CAN frame is to be interpreted. So for example, the DBC file for the J1939 protocol will tell you that there is a parameter called engine speed it is contained in a PGN, which is another name within the J1939 protocol for the CAN ID. So essentially, once you find this particular identifier in your data, you know that within the payload of this CAN frame, engine speed is hidden. And it happens to be within the, uh, the bits that start at bit 24, and it has a length of two bytes. So essentially, you take out or you carve out two bytes of data from the payload, you convert it to decimal form, and then you multiply it by a scale factor, the one you see here, and you add an offset, in this case, zero. And now you have a value that you can actually interpret, in this case, the RPM value. Now, let's assume most of you are automotive OEM engineers already. In this case, you're like the lucky guy here on the left because you will have easy access to the DBC file you need for decoding the data you need. That is because if you're working in a team in, let's say, Volkswagen, and you're developing a new prototype vehicle, and you need to extract CAN data from this, then hopefully, if you know you are a trustable guy in the team, you will be able to get access to the very sensitive DBC file that tells you how to interpret the data from this particular application. But generally, this is only information that is known to the manufacturer. They may share it with you if you are a partner, for example, some type of system integrator, you may be able to reverse engineer it if you are in the aftermarket and need this data and you are very skilled. And in some cases, you may get the DPC file together with the product you buy. So if you're buying a sensor module, a robot arm or whatever, you might get the DPC file as part of that package. But if not, then by default, you are in the unlucky situation of the guy over on the right who does not have the DPC file and who essentially just has a bunch of data that he cannot interpret. Luckily for the aftermarket customers or aftermarket users that might be in this call here, there are a number of exceptions to this rule, uh, specifically the three you see here. The J1939 DBC file is a standardized DBC file that contains information that allows you to decode data from most heavy duty vehicles, and it allows you to decode most of the data. And in most practical use cases, you can get the signals you need to facilitate your use case with a J1939 DBC file. Some of the data is still proprietary and only known to the OEM, but that data might be redundant for your use case. Same goes if you are in the maritime sector, we have an EMEA DBC file that you can use for that purpose. 
And same goes if you are working with cars, at least non-electric vehicles, then you can use the free OBD2 DPC file. So you can find these on our products page, but essentially they allow you to decode data from standardized protocols, even if you are not the OEM. So just to recap, Canvas data logging essentially involves having a device to record the data. You need the proper adapter cable to connect to your application of interest that will allow you to collect the raw Canvas data. And if you have the DPC file, you can combine these two and use relevant software tools to process the data and create signal values or human readable data that you can visualize, analyze, and do many things with. That is basically the recap of Canvas data logging here. Now, as explained, you need a device for recording the data. And uh, that is where we come in at CSS Electronics, and that is what we specialize in. There are many ways you can record data from a, from a Canvas application. Maybe you want to stream it via USB in real time, but in most practical use cases where you need to record data over longer periods of time, you need what is called a Canvas data logger. So a Canvas data logger essentially lets you record the raw Canvas data to an SD card over an extended period of time. And that is beneficial because you don't have to sit there with a laptop in the vehicle while the data is being streamed onto your laptop for 40 days straight. So that's very nice to have. We have two of these in our professional grade uh, Canvas data logger series, the CanEdge. We have the CanEdge 1 and we have the CanEdge 2, and I'm going to introduce both of them. Importantly, these two devices are 100% equivalent, except that the CanEdge 2 also has Wi-Fi functionality. And I'll get into what that means in a moment. Now, the CanEdge 1 is our offline professional grade data logger for recording Canvas data and something called Linbus data that some of you may be familiar with. It has a number of features that I will just go through here uh, to give you an idea of how it works and what the functionality is of the device. First of all, when you are going to connect it to a vehicle, as we discussed previously, you need an adapter cable. Let's say you have a truck, you have the J1939 adapter cable that gives you the four pins you need, can bus uh, low, can high, the power and ground, and you connect this to channel one of this device here. That will automatically power on the CanEdge 1, and it automatically detects the bit rate of your CAN bus, meaning that with no configuration and straight out the box, you can start recording CAN bus data simply by connecting it to your vehicle. And you can leave it there for a couple of minutes or for two hours um, of runtime, and then you can disconnect the device simply by cutting the power. The device is 100% power safe, so you don't risk corrupting the SD card or the data by doing this. You disconnect the device, take out the SD card from the back and put it into your PC. And now you can look at CAN bus data in some of the software tools that I'll cover in a moment. So in other words, it's very, very simple to get started uh, and there is not any configuration required upfront. At the same time, the device is designed to be used by automotive OEM engineers and they have pretty strict requirements on the, the specs that a product like this needs. To give you an example, it has two CAN bus channels because you often need more than one uh, CAN network. It has two LIN bus channels and you can record all of these four channels in parallel. It supports CAN FD on both CAN channels. It supports lossless logging at any frequency. So that means if you have 4,000 frames going on per second on both of these CAN channels, that's not an issue. You can record all of it without losing any frames. At the same time, that data is timestamped with a 50 microsecond resolution, which means that it is very precise. And that is important if you need to look into the data at a very detailed level. On top of this, it records things or it allows you to record things like error frames and other things that can be important when you're looking at diagnosing CAN networks. All of this functionality is packaged in an extremely small package. We are probably the team that manufactures the smallest professional grade data logger available on the market. And it essentially fits the palm of your hand despite packing a lot of functionality. On top of this, you can configure the device to a very high extent. If you just use it by default, you essentially get a one-to-one -one copy of the CAN bus traffic that is going on in your CAN bus, which is great for some use cases. If you need all of the data, then no problem. 
but you can also customize the data so that you optimize specifically for your use case. Maybe you only want to record some CAN identifiers. Maybe you want some of them to be recorded at one frequency and others at another frequency. And maybe you want to reject some of them. All of this you can easily set up in the configuration. Same goes for triggers, compression, and many other aspects of the data logging. So in other words, you can get it exactly the way you want uh, with a few steps. At the same time, we also uh, have designed this device with security in mind. So many of the OEMs we work with are very sensitive around their data. And therefore it's important that you are able to encrypt the data at rest on the SD card. And in many areas like Europe and California, like with CCPA and GDPR, this is in many cases a legal requirement. Um, although it's probably not done always, but in principle it is in many areas. And this is also something you can configure on the device. Finally, we designed the device to be interoperable. So we use standardized formats like a JSON configuration files. We use a file format called MDF or MF4, again, standardized within the automotive industry. So we try to make it easy to use any tool you want to use. You don't have to use our tools, but we do offer a suite of 100% free and 100% open source software tools for those that prefer to use our software options. And I'll get to that a bit later. This is a frequently asked question when it comes to a product like the Canage One. So how much data can you record, let's say on an eight gigabyte SD card? If you record all of the data from a normal truck, you might be looking at 700 frames per second. And that means you would typically be able to record for four days straight on an eight gig and for 15 days straight on a 32 gig. Now this is 24 seven logging and assumes you record everything. When the card is full, the device will automatically delete the oldest data to make room for new data, meaning you have a rolling window of data at any given time. In practice, you will not very often record everything. You might not need, let's say, engine speed every 20 milliseconds. So you want to say that some parameters you don't want to record and some parameters you want to record at a lower frequency. So in most realistic scenarios, you may be looking at 100 or even you know, close to a 500 day uh, amount of data that you can record. So again, you fully control this. As a result of this functionality, this has become an extremely popular black box uh, data logger for automotive purposes from many or for many different OEMs. In particular, many OEMs install this device to capture uh, and diagnose issues that happen in, uh, infrequently. So maybe you have a problem that occurs uh, on customer sites every 30 days. Here, installing a CAN logger uh, into the application like JCB does will allow you to actually capture the data around this event and thus diagnose the issue in a much better way than you can do through the built-in diagnostic functionality of the vehicle. Some also use this to get scale into their uh, fleet analysis or the prototype analysis like Bosch. So maybe you need to deploy or collect data from many vehicles at the same time. And here, there is simply no better value to cost ratio than the Canage one for getting a lot of data collected from a lot of vehicles. We of course also have OEMs that install this with all the production vehicles. So essentially, whenever a new crane leaves the production site, for example, it has a Canage one inside it. That means that if a customer complains about something one year down the row and wants to incur his warranty, then you have the opportunity to actually go and look at the data and check if the usage of your application was as per your warranty terms or not. So there are many different use cases for this. At the same time, you may sometimes want to not manually go and collect the data from your application. And here the CANH2 is a useful and very powerful tool. It's essentially like a CANH1, but it allows you to automatically offload the log files you record to your own server via Wi-Fi. And they can do so securely and you can control the device over the air with firmware and configuration updates. The way this works is illustrated here. So let's say you got your CANH2, now you uh, unboxed it and you want to set it up for a remote data collection. The first step is that you set up your own server. So this is an important factor. We don't at CSS Electronics host the server for you. You set it up on your own. And some may find this you know, daunting, but in practice it takes five to 10 minutes because it is so accessible today. The cool thing about this is that you get to own all of your data, you control everything we are not involved in any way with your data, your DBC files. So all of it is controlled by you. 
and you don't have to pay us obscene fees for storing the data in what it would anyway be a cloud server in the end. So you can choose many different options, AVS, Azure, Google Cloud, or any other uh, cloud server. And you can also self-host the data uh, or self-host the server using something called MinIO, which is an open source S3 server tool. We have guides for setting this up. And we, of course, help if you have any questions on it with free technical support. In addition to setting up the server, you need to select what Wi-Fi access point the Connect 2 should uh, connect through. This could be a stationary router in your office or your production hall. It could be a cellular Wi-Fi router that you power in the USB socket of your car or through the Connect 2. But it could even be your smartphone uh, shared internet. So any Wi-Fi router will essentially work. Then you put these details into the Connect 2, and now it's ready to uh, offload your data. This is often used, for example, in warehouse telematics. So you can imagine having forklifts and AGVs where they periodically get within range of a uh, battery charging area. When they are out of range of the Wi-Fi router at the battery charging area, data is recorded to the SD card of the Canet2. And when they get within range, data is automatically offloaded in chronological order to your server. When a file has been uploaded successfully, the Canet2 automatically deletes that file from the SD card, freeing up space. So you can imagine in a setup where you have periodic access to Wi-Fi, the data will accumulate and basically get offloaded automatically from the SD card to your server. No physical intervention is required. The same goes if you're going to use cellular coverage and cellular Wi-Fi routers to offload your data. You will, you will essentially lock the data to the SD card as before. But here, whenever a new log file is ready on the SD card, it immediately gets pushed to your own server and deleted from the SD card. But if there is a coverage issue, you don't lose data. And this part is important if you are in the OEM business. You can get all of your data perfectly mirrored, no gaps at all, which is nice when you're looking for that one error that happens for two minutes every 30 days. As a result, this is a very popular tool across many OEMs. You have Volkswagen, for example, using the Canage 2 as part of their evaluation of their own telematics device. Here, they use it essentially to save costs, so they don't want to physically have to retrieve the data from the SD card. They set up their own self-hosted server and get the data there. You also have users like Kvanalan and Cummins that set up a uh, larger scale uh, recording from the field using cellular routers, uploading the data to Azure or ABS, and then automatically processing that data through tools like Python, dashboards, and MATLAB. And I'll get a bit more into that. And you also have cases like Novea over here on the right, which is pretty cool. They monitor fuel cells in a lab and they uh, automatically transfer the data to their own server where they set up visualization dashboards, but they also set up um, predictive maintenance in a simple form where every new log file is analyzed as it's coming in. And if certain thresholds are crossed, an alert is sent to the relevant engineer to take action on it. So these are just some examples of use cases that uh, the Canage 2 can be used for uh, in the field and in practice. Again, you can go for our case study section where we have 50 of these available with full descriptions. In some cases, uh, you may want to add additional data to the data from your vehicle. So let's imagine you have a truck, you're recording data from that truck, which is nice. But let's imagine you also would like to have the position of the truck, like the GPS position. Maybe you want the acceleration, maybe you want the speed or the odometer data, and you might not be able to get that from the truck's canvas. Here you can easily connect one of our sensor to CAN modules like the GPS to CAN, or if you need temperature, you can use our thermocouple to CAN module. And if you need analog or digital or pulse input sensors, you can use our new CAN mod input module. These modules can be used standalone with any device. So if you have a vector tool, if you have a peak tool, then you can use these modules as well and easily connect them. Uh, you can even use them directly into your CAN bus if you have easy use that you want to react to certain CAN frames based on this data here. But a very common use case is to connect one or more of these modules on the second port of a CANH2 or a CANH1. The nice thing about the CANH is that it can take the input power, from example, from your vehicle and redirect it as a five volt power output on the second port. That allows you to power up to 10 of these modules here. And these modules can then produce CANVAS data that is injected into your log files in perfect time synchronization with the vehicle data. You can daisy chain these modules flexibly 
So that means you can fully customize what kind of data you need to add to your existing data from the vehicle or the, uh, the industrial machinery. That was um, a bit about, about our hardware. And of course, there are many more things we could go through, but I hope this gives a quick overview of what the CanEdge does and how you can optionally use the CanMod accessory tools. To uh, take this uh, last section here, we will cover just briefly the software tools that are available for the CanEdge. As explained, we design the CanEdge with interoperability in mind. We don't want to lock you to a specific set of software. Instead, we want to make it possible for you to use the software you prefer to use. So if you want to use one of our competitor software tools, that's cool with us. If you have a proprietary platform you want to integrate with, that's fine. We make it very easy for you to do so through a toolbox of available tools. That also means that some of the software tools I present here are created by us, and some of them are simply integrations uh, that we facilitate with existing tools that support the formats that we happen to use. We split our tools into two uh, types of tools. We have tools for configuring your devices and managing your data. And then we have tools for actually processing your data using the raw data and the DPC files as explained earlier. If we look at the management of devices and data first, um, there are three uh, quick tools I'll mention here. The first one is the configuration editor. This is a simple tool uh, that you can open in your browser as I'm doing here. So if I open this up in the browser, I can uh, load a configuration file, for example, from the SD card of a CanEdge. So here I have inserted an SD card from a, a CanEdge 2. I open up this configuration file, and now you can see the settings that are being used on this CanEdge 2 in a nice and visualized way. And I can go in here and I can modify various things. I can also look at this in advanced mode. And this is where you can set up things like filters, you can set up transmit lists, uh, trigger signals, and you can also add the details for your Wi-Fi and your server. Once you have made a change and you want to update your device, you just download the configuration file and put it onto the SD card. And that's it. So it's very easy to use. You can even use it offline just by saving the tool like this. And then you can use it without internet connectivity. So that is a tool you will use the first time you connect the device, both a CanEdge 1 and a CanEdge 2. But obviously, if you have a CanEdge 2, then there is a smarter way to work with it once you have connected the tool to your cloud server or to your uh, self-hosted server. And here we uh, provide another tool called CanCloud. Again, browser-based, which means you just open up the URL. You can self-host it if you want, or you can use the one we host. And it's basically like a website. You provide the details for your server in, a, in order to log in, and you can also load those from a configuration file. When you log into your own server, you are essentially going to see the files that are available on your server. But you see them in a nicely structured way, as evident here. In particular, for the uh, CanEdge 2, you can see over on the left-hand side, we have a number of these devices connected to the server. And for each of them, I have given them a meta name, a forklift one, truck one. You can give it whatever you want here in order to more easily identify each of the devices from each other. You can upload a cool picture if you like, that's optional. And then you can go in and find the log files that have been uploaded by the device. The files will be split by power cycle. So typically you will have one folder of files for every trip in your vehicle, as an example. Within each folder, you can see the files, you can download these, and you can also see when was each file recorded over here and when were the files uploaded. If you then need to modify the configuration of your device, that's pretty easy. Now this one should be called Martin's forklift. And we remove this. And then I just click submit to S3. And this will actually trigger an over the, over the air update of this device the next time this CanEdge 2 device connects to the server. If I want to track my devices in the field to make sure everything is working as it should, that's also easily done through the status dashboard. So think of this as a cockpit for managing your devices. It's completely optional. You don't have to use CanCloud for this, but it's an optional software that is very easy to work with. Some of our users, however, prefer to manage their CanEdge 2 devices and the files through other tools. For example, some of them will map the S3 server as a local drive, which allows you to just work with your log files as if they were stored locally on your PC. And this gets really cool if you're also working with scripts like Python, MATLAB, other things, because you can just refer to this within the scripting environment as if it was a local folder. 
that was a bit about managing your devices, uh, managing your data. But of course, you also want to analyze the data you're recording in uh, different ways. And here there are a number of tools available. The first tool that we have is uh, what we call MD MDF4 converters. So these are simple executables for Windows and Linux where you drag and drop a log file onto a converter and bam, now you got a vector ASCII version of that log file or a peak trace or a CSV version. Essentially, you're getting the raw data into another log file format compatible with competitor tools or compatible with whatever you need to get it into. You can, of course, uh, drag and drop folders of log files, and you can also use this uh, through the command line for automation purposes. But this is one way that the CanEdge allows you to quite easily integrate with many other tools uh, of your preference. If you don't have a preferred tool for your general purpose data logging, then I really like this tool called SRMMDF that we natively integrate with. The tool lets you load your raw log files. So again, if you have uh, essentially a log file on your SD card and you want to open it and review the raw canvas data, you just open up a SAM MDF like this. Then you find your log file here on the SD card, browse to it. And you can then look at the raw canvas data like this. So you will have your CAN IDs and you will have your payloads over here and your timestamps. But you can also load a DPC file, like for example, a J1939 DPC file in order to get the decoded version of this data or the human readable form of it. And the cool thing is now you can quite easily look at things like engine speed, for example. So if you want to plot this, you just do like this, add a window, plot, and bam, now we're looking at engine speed from this particular log file. So as you can see, a few clicks, and it supports a lot of cool stuff like time synchronized GPS plots. So it works really well with the combination of the CAN mod GPS and the CAN edge as well. It of course also allows you to export data and it has a nice Python API beneath it that allows you to automate many of these things. Speaking of automation, many automotive engineers work with MATLAB and here we natively integrate with MATLAB for our log file format and have been working with the MapWorks team on this. So if you have the vehicle network toolbox, it's very easy to work with the data and do whatever you want within the MATLAB environment. If some of you think Python is more cool, you can also use that. Here we have a really nice Python API, which lets you list data uh, from any device, both from local disk or from your S3 server directly. So you just provide you know, the devices you want to list data for. You provide a start period and a stop period, and you get all of the log files that have been uh, found in this particular period. Then you can load the raw data, you load your DPC files, and now you can process the data and get the physical values into a pandas data frame, which is a common format popular within Python. And anybody here who knows Python will know that then you can do magic. You can do whatever you want with that integrated into anything. And we, of course, provide many API example scripts for getting you started with this. And finally, a very popular tool within this area is Grafana. Here, Grafana is a dashboard visualization tool. It's open source. It's the most popular platform for creating customized dashboards. And we provide different ways that you can integrate your CanEdge data with Grafana. The magic glue that enables this is our Python API, but you don't have to do uh, programming for this because we have created plug and play scripts that make it quite easy to get your data into a database for visualization or directly to fetch data from your S3 server and visualize it in Grafana. And I think this is personally one of my favorite tools because you get to have fun with uh, creating nice looking dashboards once you have your data uh, processed and into, let's say, a, a database, then from there, it's a simple matter of copy pasting a curry here that you can see down below. And then you can modify these charts in whatever way you want. So you don't need to be a hardcore programmer in order to do this. You just set it up uh, the way you want here. And there are many examples of cool stuff that you can do uh, with this. If you go to our software tab on the website, you will see the playground that I'm in here, and you can go and actually look at some of these dashboard examples as well. So really cool stuff. Um, and uh, you can follow us on LinkedIn, where we sometimes post cool new dashboards. I'm personally working on my new Kia EV6 electric vehicle dashboard, which is going to be really cool. That was it from me on Canvas data logging. I hope it gives you an overview of the available tools for the CanEdge, along with what the hardware does. 
you can always contact us or Grid Connect if you want a one-on-one -on -one session where we go into detail on your particular use case so that we can learn what are your requirements and what would be the best solution for you. But I hope this helps you get started and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thanks, Martin. We do have quite a lot of questions. Uh, I wasn't able to uh, get to through the, um, the Q&A uh, from Zoom, but I will read a few here that uh, might be, um, let's say, interesting for everyone to hear. And although I lost the window somewhere, oh, there it is. Okay. So um, let's see. So a lot of folks are asking about specific applications, like, um, you know, can I use this with Vector? Can, um, can I use it with MATLAB? Can you give me details on MATLAB, um, et cetera? So I, I think some of this you kind of just briefly touched on, you know, mentioning uh, MATLAB and, uh, and others. Are there tutorials available for this um, on the CSS website? Yeah, so my recommendation, if you are looking to get a more understanding specifically on the software tools, if you go to the software tab on our website, you can see the, all the tools I went through here. And uh, some guy from CSS has created uh, very nice and detailed instructions and tutorials for all of these. So actually, if you go to something like this, let's take the MATLAB example. If you go and you want to learn more about how does the MATLAB integration work, you can go and find a tutorial where we go into detail with this on a high level, you know, what are the functionalities, what are the benefits, what kind of stuff can you do? And we then also have links for specific API examples so that you can get log file data, you can get DPC files, and you can actually try this out in MATLAB today uh, so that you don't have to, you know, get a can edge and actually record data. You can just go to our GitHub page, check out the API examples and get started. Uh, so we do this for all of the software tools. Uh, so for every software tool, there is like a, an intro like this. Uh, and that would be where I would start if you're interested in the software side. And then as to your other question, Rick, on the cases, like can you use it with application XYZ? There are two ways to look at this. On our guide section on the website, we have all of our simple intros if you're looking to learn more about OBD2, J1939. But just below this, we have application articles where we go into detail on specific applications. So maybe you're interested in heavy duty data logging, then check out our J1939 data log article. If you're interested in logging data from your car, check out this one. If you're interested in electric vehicles, check out this one. And a supplement to all of these articles, we then have the case studies page that I mentioned where you can essentially see case studies from uh, many different customers uh, of the CanEdge and our other devices. And here they explain essentially in pretty great detail how they use the devices and, uh, and what type of application that they have. So I would definitely go and check out some of these case studies uh, to get a feel for what you can use it for. Great, thanks, Martin. Um, there was a question about security and it was a little vague, but I believe it may have had to do with when connecting to uh, the cloud S3. Can you go into the security aspect at all for us? Yeah, and, and just like the other stuff, <laughs> I guess our, our slogan is we have an article for that. Yep. If you go to our guide section, you will find our CAN data security article. In this, we cover both, you know, what are some of the common risks or concerns you might have, like making sure you are compliant with GDPR, CCPA, Maybe you are concerned about your data integrity. Maybe you are concerned about exposing your server. Maybe you're concerned that somebody will take over the vehicle through the CanEdge 2 and make you know, a cyber attack. We explain what the risks are and how we uh, essentially make sure that you are not exposed to those through the CanEdge solution. So you can go into great detail there, but the short answer is you can encrypt the data on the SD card you can encrypt the passwords that you use for your Wi-Fi access point for your server. You can set up customized user policies for your server so you fully control how much access does each CanEdge 2 device have to your server. If you have multiple people involved with the project, you can give each of those people different user policies so that, for example, they can only read the data but not perform over-the-air updates. And many other things uh, can be set up uh, in order to facilitate the security. And we explain how to do it. And we, of course, again here, 
provide a detailed support. And that is part of what we do. Uh, you send us an email and we will go all in on your use case to make sure that you, uh, that you get uh, set up the way you need. Great. Um, there's a couple questions around um, can the can the can edge uh, detect um, bus interference or uh, bus outages and what would happen if there was a bus error uh, during logging? Yeah, so with with the latest firmware of the uh, can edge, it supports error frame locking both for can bus errors and lin bus errors. And uh, surprise, we also have an article on this that you can find on our guide section. <laughs> and here we show you essentially, uh, you know, a bit about how CAN bus errors work in general. But we also have some practical applications where we use the CAN Edge. We also use uh, one of Peak's devices. And we actually create different types of CAN bus errors. And we illustrate how this will look like in the log files that you get. And of course, you can also get a package with all of the uh, log files so that you can open these in a SAM MDF and look at it for yourselves uh, to see how, how it would work. And then you can determine if this is what you need for your particular use case. Yep, and you can uh, get the uh, Peak product uh, from Grid Connect as well. So if you're interested in trying to recreate this, uh, Grid Connect can help you with that. There was also some questions around the, you know, can it be used to detect uh, and maybe like for troubleshooting can errors, um, the answer for that is no. Um, the can edge is a, you know, a data logger. There are other tools available that can help you figure out. Um, yeah, I think, I think one, one, one just quick distinction is we, we have many that use it for troubleshooting, but it is, you can say you are recording log files. It's not a USB streaming device. If you right. need that, you can, you can use peak. So you can use the CL 1000 or 2000 from us. But if you are going to troubleshoot something where the way you troubleshoot it is by recording the data, you know, standalone to the SD card, then definitely the can edge can be used for that. But for streaming, we would recommend Peaks or, or the CL1000 and 2000 here. Yeah, yeah they are, uh, the, the can edge is not a, a real time um, streaming kind of product. Correct. Okay, uh, let me just check here for a few more. We have a couple minutes. Um, let's see. Uh, this must be someone who's already using the can edge. Um, I noticed that there can be many different files in the same trip folder. What is the max size of the individual log files? And is there any loss between the stopping and starting of a log file and the start of a new one? Yeah, so this is a good question. Um, the can edge will record log files in a configurable size. So this is something you control through the configuration editor. In this particular case here, I've told the can edge that it should split files if they grow to 512 megabytes in size, or if they get more than 10 seconds long. And, and if you know Canvas, you can imagine which one of these conditions will be hit first. It's gonna be the 10 second one. So a realistic use case, for example, is like this, where you create 10 minute uh, sized log files. That means every time 10 minutes have passed, the can edge will close down the existing log file and start the recording of a new log file. And there is no data loss in this process. It will not lose a single frame between closing a file and creating a new one. Now, if the power is cut in the middle of a log file, let's say after five minutes, then that last log file will be safely shut down at those five uh, minutes. And then the can edge will start a new log file in a new folder once the device is started up again. So essentially, this is the logic of how the files are structured. They are put in folders based on power cycles. Um, you can maximally create 512 megabyte log files. And I would not recommend to go that large. Uh, personally, I would go for maybe 20 to 50 megabytes. And a single log file folder or these power cycle folders can contain up to 255 log files. After that, the device will automatically start in a new folder. Okay, great. Uh, there's a number of questions about uh, how many CAN channels and LIN channels can you record simultaneously? You know, can you do two CAN and two LIN at the same time? Or do you have plans to add more uh, CAN channels to, uh, to a data logger? 
Yeah, good question. So, so you can record with the CanEdge uh, a total of two Canvas channels and two Limbus channels at the same time, so in parallel. And to do so, you just need to match the pinout that you will find in the uh, configure or in the documentation of the device. You can see it here, but you can also find that if you go to the tech specs page of each product. Assuming you connect your two LIN buses and two CAN buses at the same time, according to the pinout, all of that data is coming into a single log file, and you are then able in the uh, log file to separate data by their channel. We have many customers that would like more than two CAN channels for reasons also mentioned before. There are some that deploy two CAN edge units at the same time, or even some that deploy four CAN edge units. You can do it, but the time synchronization is not going to be perfect between these units, even with the CAN edge 2 that has a Wi-Fi synchronization of the time. So if it is really important that the timestamping is perfect between them, then that might not be the best solution. What we are launching most likely early next year is what we call a CAN mod router. So this will be part of our CAN mod series that we discussed earlier. It will have the same form factor. It will look very much like the CAN mod input that you see here. And the basic idea is that it will allow you to connect four CAN bus networks on one side, individual networks that can then be joined through this module into a single CAN bus network output. Super. That means that assuming you satisfy bus load conditions and you can remap the CAN IDs as part of the configuration, then a single CAN H2 can use this on the second port and effectively record one CAN bus through channel one and four networks through channel two. So once that comes out, that would be the best solution for those use cases. Perfect. Um, a simple one maybe, uh, does the CAN Edge 2 support WPA? For Wi-Fi? Uh, I believe it supports WPA2, uh, WPA so that yep. should be listed here. Let me just do a quick check. Yeah, so supports WPA and WPA2 uh, as listed down here in the security section. Okay. Let's see, we are one minute um, from the end of the official webinar. We still have 161 folks with us. So I don't know, Martin, if you're able to stay a few minutes longer, we can continue to try to sure. go through some of these. It's fine by me. And also as, as information, I think we mentioned it in the start, but for those that joined that, I, I hope this is also recorded, Rick. Uh, yeah, it's being recorded. So uh, right. if you do need to stop, uh, don't worry. No, I'm, I'm, I'm available, but, uh, no, but, but just I mean, uh, that we will also distribute that recording afterwards. As yeah, well. yeah, no, that's so, what I meant to say. Yeah. To go. yeah. Um, okay, so let me kind of go through these a little more methodically. We're still getting a few coming in. Um, how can one device identify between different standards as J1939 or ISO 15765? I don't know if that one makes sense to me, but maybe you can decipher that one. Yeah, so, so I think a quick answer on that one is that when you look at the raw Canvas data being recorded by the device, you can say the device does not have a protocol distinction. The CanEdge doesn't know that this is J1939 right. data and that some other data are recorded as UDS data. That part comes through the interpretation that comes with the DPC file and the way you process the data. Right. In the case where you need to record multi-frame, uh, data and you need to uh, decode this, then you can do so using some of our software tools. And of course, we also have examples and guides on this. UDS, for example, for uh, the uh, Kia EV6 that, uh, that I'm working with, that requires that I send multi-frame request messages using the CanEdge and that the responses which come across multiple frames, that they are, um, sec or that they are reassembled into a single response frame and then processed accordingly uh, using the Python API. So we explain how this works in our article and how the CanEdge is uh, used for it. And again, in the API examples on our GitHub, we also have examples with multi-frame data. But short answer is it, the, the protocol application comes with the DBC file and the software tool, not the CanEdge itself. Okay. Um, 
let's see. So someone is asking, uh, what is the behavior of the can edge two if the S3 runs out of space? So the, you know, if you had if you had a cloud application that ran out of space, does the can edge yeah. two know anything about that? No, I, I would probably have to check what the behavior is, but I think basically the can edge will not know that the cloud application is out of space. It, it may attempt to offload the log file and because it does not receive a successful response from the server, because that log file was not possible to store on the server, it will fail and therefore the log file will not get uploaded. I believe that will be the behavior and therefore you will then start accumulating data on the SD card of the devices. That's also why this dashboard within can cloud can be useful because you can essentially keep track of how is the storage percentage used on your SD cards. If you expect this to be near 0% at any given time and it suddenly starts accumulating, maybe something's wrong. Of course, if you use a cloud server like uh, Amazon Cloud, then you will just have infinite space as long as you pay Jeff what he wants. So in that case, it's not a problem because it is elastic. That is also why if you're going to deploy hundreds of devices, I would personally go for a cloud server like AVS because you don't have to worry about the scalability. Whereas if you need to store several terabytes of data on a self-hosted on-premise machine, that might be more of a challenge. Right. Whereas if you just you know, have a few devices, a local self-hosted server is also perfectly fine. Yeah, great. Okay, thanks. Um, another question about uh, converting to other tools. Someone is asking, can you replay the data in the vector canoe uh, rest bus simulation? Yeah, we actually have a case study for this. So Morelli, uh, which is an automotive OEM, they use the, the can edge two and, and in some cases also can edge one to record data to an SD card. They have the MF4 files, they finalize it using one of our converters, which makes it possible to load it inside vector tools like Cano and Canalyzer. And then they use their existing vector streaming tools to replay those log files from the field as part of their simulation and, and you can say in lab and in-house testing. So this is an example where they combine, you know, the can edge because it's a very low cost device. The, the can edge one and, and can edge two, they typically cost, you know, one tenth of a comparable uh, vector device. So it's a very low cost way to get scale in your field logging, but you can keep using the software tools that you are familiar with for actually analyzing and, and utilizing that data. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> can your software solutions be used to analyze data from other devices? For example, I might receive data from a colleague or a customer using vector or peak tools. Can I analyze their data as you showed here? In some cases, um, you can say the Assam MDF uh, GUI tool, for example, that is a tool that we have not made, but rather a tool we integrate with. And it is a general purpose tool for what is called MDF log files. It also supports vector log files. So this tool is also used by vector customers that have you know, log files from the vector tools. Um, I don't think Peak directly integrates with this tool, but, uh, but I I'm not familiar if there is a conversion of Peak Trace to MF4. Um, when it comes to our Python API, then uh, it is open source. And we have a, I think we have a couple of customers that have modified it to use with other competitor tools. But you can say, since it's a free and open source tool, it's not something that we uh, directly, uh, you can say, spend time on supporting. So we have not made the API to be able to work with other tools, but we also don't prohibit it. So, uh, so you would just need to, to modify it potentially a bit in that case. Um, and therefore the same goes for the other tools as well. Uh, here, here's another one. We had a couple on this one um, or similar anyway. Can we log data using the .a2i files for the XCP CCP protocol? Yeah, so, so the can edge does not support uh, HL files uh, directly. So it's not possible, just like it's not possible to put DPC files on the device because at the end of the day, it will record raw canvas data. And right. XCP, uh, CCP is an area where I, I have to say I'm not uh, the foremost expert yet. Um, if you are able to set up the communication flow that is required for, let's say, requesting and, and logging this uh, data, 
then the CanEdge can record the raw CAN frames, and then you will most likely be able to use our API to post-process the data. So I think it depends on your use case. Feel free to send us an email with a specific application you're interested in, and then we can go uh, deep dive on whether that is feasible or not. If it is not feasible, it may be something that we facilitate over time through a firmware update. Okay. Uh, after a JSON file is uploaded in the SD card, every time, date, and time error in recorded log, can you suggest solution for it? Uh, I'm not sure that was. So this might be a, a user that has problems with the time stamping of uh, yeah, of the yeah. log files. So generally, we would always recommend you know send us an email with you know your JSON file, your configuration file, and the log files. But typically, the issue might be that you are, you can say, recording the data in a certain time zone, and you might need it in another time zone. It could also be that for some reason you have configured the device with an, an offset in the timestamping that is unexpected, and that needs to be corrected then. So that is something that is controlled within here. Uh, but if you have trouble with it, send us an email via our contact form, and we'll help you out uh, ASAP. Great. Um... Is there a better way to tell if the can edge device is done uh, saving and creating log files on the SD card than waiting for the lights to stop flashing? Uh, this person says they ask because sometimes the time between the lights flashing can be close to 30 seconds. So the lights flashing on the backside, like the LED lights on the can edge, they will flash with a frequency that is directly linked to the frequency at which you record can frames. So if you have a high bus load, they will be flashing very frequently. If you have a low, low bus load, they flash less frequently. Um, I think generally speaking, when a log file is completed, is probably not something I would uh, you say care so much for because you can disconnect the device in the middle of a log file at any given moment. So if you need the data, the device closes that log file at the point in time in which you uh, disconnect it from power. That means it is not going to be possible anyway to time it so that you disconnect the device from power, let's say it's a CanEdge 1, at exactly the moment between two log files being created, uh, because you will most likely not time it correctly by minus or plus one second. And, and therefore, I don't think there is much point to trying to attempt to do so. Um, the important thing is there is no downside to disconnect it before a log file is, uh, is done except that that last log file being created will be lower sized than the other ones because it contains a little bit less data. Um, but again, this might be something that warrants a bit more understanding of the uh, of the question. So feel right. free to send us an email on, on that one as well. Yeah, we do have a few questions that are rather uh, brief, which I think we need a little more explanation, but um, I'll, I'll try a few more and uh, maybe we can answer the rest uh, offline. Um, and if you don't get your question answered, please feel free to reach out to either uh, Martin or Grid Connect, and we will do our best to uh, get the answer you need. All right, so here's another one. Is there an easy way to find a time-specific recording? File numbers are strictly a number, and after three days of recording, finding a specific uh, file, time file is very cumbersome. Yeah, so there are two ways to do this. If you are working with a CanH1 and, and you are inserting the SD card onto the PC, then the timestamping that you see, just like you have on your, your folders on your PC, will tell you when were each file is recorded. So that would be how you would browse through these folders and find the relevant log files being recorded at a specific point in time. If you're working with a CanH2 that uploads log files to your own server, then you have a similar concept that you can use. And I can just show that with, a, with an example here from one of my own servers. So here I have a server that I'm working with where I am uploading data from, uh, from my car. What you can see is that you have the start time column and the last modified column over here. The start time tells you when was the data actually recorded. So this folder number 17 contains two log files, a total of 36 kilobytes, and the log files were recorded on the 23rd of May between 16.09 and 16.09. It's a very short period here. But the idea is you can then see the timestamps you're looking for. So yeah. you know, okay, I need data from this. Go in here, find the relevant file, download it. And, uh, and that is you know, one way of doing it. Beautiful. So this is based purely on timestamps. Yeah. Um, 
you you can also just as a quick extra tip um, utilize the uh, Grafana dashboard. Here we have a new integration that allows you to set up the dashboard with direct linkage to an SD card or an S3 server with no database in between. And if you use this, as we call the Canage Grafana backend, it will actually tell you um, where your data is from. So I'm not going to show the dashboard, but just going to show you a picture here. In this uh, dashboard, you can have you know, your visualized data, uh, your signal plots and everything. And then there will be what we call annotations, these small markers where you can hover one of these markers and it tells you what log file is this data from. Oh, wow. And then you can quickly find this in, uh, in Ken Cloud. So I use this if I know, for example, okay, I need some data from my car when I was driving a 130 kilometers per hour, for example. That's difficult to find based on raw log files. But in this here, I can just, you know, take a full period uh, browse through until I find the relevant uh, signal uh, criteria and then find those log files quite easily. Oh, that's super cool. Very good. While we were on the time uh, issue, there's another one that came up. Can the can edge uh, automatically adjust uh, for the uh, daylight savings time? No, uh, it does not uh, support daylight savings time uh, within it. And you can say what I typically personally recommend is probably to keep the time zone that the device comes with, which is UTC. Um, this means that all of the data will be recorded in UTC time, but the different software tools that you use typically have the opportunity to show the PC time. So essentially, if you're using a SAM MDF in your uh, local time zone with the daylight savings time, that data will be displayed with your local time zone uh, as oh, the nice. timestamping. So therefore, you can say to me, the ability to set it in the configuration is in most cases redundant unless you have specific software that does not support showing this, the PC time. Again, if you have any problems with this or deeper questions on it, send us an email and, uh, and we'll get back on it. Okay, great. Um, a couple on asked about how does the uh, automatic identification for the baud rate work uh, does it iterate through all the baud rates until something makes sense they're they want to know what's under the covers there martin yeah yeah that, that's basically it so it has a list of standardized baud rates which you can also manually select in the configuration of the device and when the device boots up it will iterate through these in order to automatically detect the bit rate uh, when it matches one of the the standard baud rates you can see the list here this works in, you know, when you have an active CAN bus, like from a truck or vehicle or whatever, this works in probably 95% of the time. In a rare few cases, the pattern of the data or the amount of data may be insufficient to facilitate the bit rate auto detection. And therefore, for production uh, deployments where you have 100 devices that go into the field, we typically recommend to set the bit rate manually by using this and then setting it, you know, to the bit rate of, of relevance. And maybe in some applications, you even have the need to specify an advanced bit rate. And this is also possible in here. This can be important if you have you know, a slightly special CAN bus that may not adhere to the specifications that are used in the standard bit rates here. More on this in the documentation. I think this will be the last question um, and then we'll handle the rest of these uh, offline. Um, and I don't know whether this we need more clarification on this question, but is Wake on CAN available? Yeah, this is a good question. So you could say the device is special in the sense that the power consumption of the device is extremely low. It's below one watt, and that is low compared to what you normally have when you have, let's say, a Linux machine or something big running in the device. We don't have that. We go very bare bones. As a result, we have an extremely low power consumption. And as a result, it is in practice not relevant to have wake on CAN because you can just leave the device and it will not drain, let's say, a vehicle battery. You would have to leave it uh, in a turned off vehicle with the device turned on for 50 plus days uh, straight in order for it to have any draining effect on it. Wow. Therefore, for this reason, it is extremely rare that wake on CAN is a practical requirement uh, for, for the CANH1 and the CANH2. Um, what, what is sometimes relevant uh, and sort of referred to with Wake Garden Can is the ability to control when you start logging and when you stop logging. 
And this is possible through the control signal that you can set up if you look at the advanced configuration of the device. You have the ability to say that, for example, when engine speed exceeds X, start recording. When it goes below Y, stop recording. And the same goes for the transmission of data. And the latter one can be important because even if the consumption of the CAN edge itself is not a lot, if you are transmitting data into the CAN bus, you may be waking up the vehicle, so to speak. And you may want to avoid that in order to not drain the battery fast. And that is something you can use the control signal to do. So in particular in UDS and OBD2 applications, the control signal can be used to control when you actually request data and when you stop requesting data. And we have examples of this in the documentation as well. Okay. All right. Well, I think that is the end of the questions that uh, I would like to handle online. And like I said, uh, if there's any remaining questions, we will uh, answer those and send a, out a link or uh, an email with that, along with a link for the recording. So you can share it with your colleagues, or if there's a section you want to review, you can go back and review it. Uh, thanks again, Martin, for uh, supporting us on this webinar. No and, problem. Uh, as Martin mentioned, if you need to chat about your specific application, please feel free to reach out to uh, Grid Connect if you're here in uh, North America or reach out to Martin um, if you're elsewhere. And uh, we'll be happy to get that started for you. Um, thanks again. And if you're like more CAN webinars, we have another one coming up. Uh, this time, uh, our own Gary Mars from Grid Connect will be hosting it. It's on CAN. Um, diagnostics. So check, check us out for that. Thanks again, everyone. And uh, have a great day, no matter where in the world you are or evening or afternoon. Thanks again. Thanks. Bye, Bye guys. guys.